Hey everyone, and welcome back to what is season two of my chat with other um, researchers who work in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medical sciences. I'm lucky to know loads of amazing um, scientists and engineers, and uh, I, this channel I get to chat with them about their work. I, I you know, try and figure out what it is they do and learn a little bit about their research subjects, and also I chat to them about their work um, fighting for equity in STEM, trying to improve the climate for people who are working in STEM fields. And today, um, so this first one of season two is actually someone who has had a huge impact on me, and that is uh, Rachel Oliver from uh, the University of Cambridge. Rachel uh, led a science inquiry, uh, which went to the Science and Technology um, Committee in, in the government. Um, and trying to ask for transparency on and improved data on different um, diversities uh, on you know people who have um, applied for funding in STEM fields, uh, and it was actually successful. We'll talk about it. It's a shame there was a change of government and things have changed and slowed down. But um, no, uh, Rachel sort of led this charge, and I was looking to sort of um, hold on to her coattails along the way. Um, and so she's been fantastic to work with and she's a huge uh, inspiration for me. So without further ado, uh, let's get into it, shall we? So, Rachel, hi, how are you doing? I'm all right, hi, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm good, thanks, I'm good, thanks. So uh, I think for confused people that are in sort of January, February, when this goes out, I've got a Christmas tree and a, a Christmas Yoda, but that's because I'm recording it in December. So um, <laughs> Rachel's got beautiful office background there. <laughs> real life lab, real life uh, working in the lab, in the office. So um, who are you? What's your elevator pitch? What, who are you? What do you do? And um, what's your science all about? So I'm Rachel Oliver. I am a professor in material science at the University of Cambridge. Um, I guess you probably had a few material sciencey people on. Um, maybe, maybe not. My my material of interest, the thing I focus mostly on, is gallium nitride, which is a semiconductor material. And people will know gallium nitride, or rather, be Gallium nitride will be part of their lives mostly because it's the light emitting material in energy efficient light bulbs. Um, so if you go and get an energy efficient, they're called LED light bulbs, light emitting diode, then gallium nitride is most of what makes up the actual light emitting diodes in those light bulbs. And it's the material that enabled that technology. That's so cool. That's awesome. So uh, people will be very familiar. I think this is the one nice thing about material science. Like, people are like oh i didn't know that was a subject and then it's like well i used to work for a company that made the inside of crisp packets and your tv and your touchscreen and your solar cells even our lights that every material science is everywhere and people it's such an underrated science i think well yeah i mean i get tired of people saying to me oh so you're into textiles or fashion it's a nice career for a girl i get a lot of that um but yeah uh, actually textile science is really cool but i don't do it <laughs> yeah 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 it's like it's cool but it's it's not me it's not what i'm doing <laughs> yeah i think um i don't know i think i've obviously just sort of i immediately explain i think i must obviously just really straight away explain what it is like you know my glasses i've got to <laughs> just, I think I just go straight into the spiel about what it is to just sort of try and nip that in the bud um Although to be fair, like my first, so I first got into material science. Um, I worked for a company, so I did an electrical undergrad, and I worked for a company that made vacuum deposition equipment. And of course, when I went there, I thought they made vacuum cleaners. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, I mean, so I did, I did do some research before I went for the interview, like, but. <laughs> because otherwise well, that would have been really you've been bad demonstrating a good ability to think on your feet you'd be fine <laughs> yeah yeah i mean mm. i didn't understand what they were talking about at the time but at least i knew that it wasn't vacuum cleaners at least that was something yeah so how long have you been working in uh sort of material science did you come straight into it or did you come through another route what was your path so my degree is in engineering with material science um but 
So I did an undergrad at Oxford and at the time you could do a joint honours course in half engineering, half material science roughly, which doesn't exist anymore, which is sad. Um, mm. But um, yeah, so my, I decided I wanted to be a material scientist during my A-levels essentially and I went looking for materials-y degree courses and they basically fell into kind of two categories. There were the ones that were really kind of physics of materials more than anything yeah. else. That were the more engineering oriented ones and I decided I was more of an engineer I saw myself more as an engineer at the time so then I I looked for an engineering oriented course to do which is basically why I wanted to do the course at Oxford which no longer exists so what people like me do now I do not know <laughs> yeah and that's it's a real shame because I would love to because I'm more the engineering side of it as well and the materials background I've got started in industry and came through so it's been all the practical side and mm. You know, even when you're thinking about lecturing, I'd love to lecture on that. But the stuff that we do now, which is more physics-y, that's not my background. It's not what I know. Yeah. I mean, I love the physics-y side as well, but I think um, materials is so important in engineering. And you should always have that awareness of materials and anything you're designing in an engineering context. So yeah. kind of degrees that don't provide that. Well, so the degrees that provide that is a better way of putting it degrees that provide that knowledge that provide that crossover between the kind of design build test thinking of an engineer and the the materials aspects i think are really valuable so it's kind of sad it's gone yeah yeah and like i say it's just my knowledge it's my knowledge based and my background it's not that i don't enjoy the other stuff as well it's just that that's what i know so mm. yeah no I, i'd um it's funny i've been sort of thinking about the lecturing side of it and it's just not the right course for me where i am at the moment to, to mm. be sort of teaching it so um but of course you came through uh, when they did have that and i think you know one or two other people that i work with that uh were in the <laughs> same you, cohort. Yeah. yeah yeah because of course you know my um the the professor that runs my lab susie speller so <laughs> Um, yeah so she was a proper material scientist and i did engineer the engineering oriented course but yeah no we've known each other for years yeah 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 susie's a great boss just not saying that just because in case you listen but uh, she's, she's good <laughs> to work with i enjoy it going really well uh, but yeah you're right she definitely takes it more from the sort of physicsy um sort of interview yeah. yeah um which is why we work well together i think groups always work really well when you've got people that have got sort of more engineering aspects more physics aspects and more chemistry aspects i mm. really like it when you have a mix of those three areas um i think i've had a lot more ideas when i've been talking with those people um but yeah, yeah that's me and so you've been working with gallium nitride for a while so. Yeah, so my, my PhD is where I started working in gallium nitride and some of the things that I developed during my PhD I'm still using now. So that's, um, oh God, <laughs> since I started my PhD, that's now 20 years ago. <laughs> I've not moved on. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> uh, um, it's funny actually because I've been thinking about the technology that I used for my PhD and my postdoc, which is probably eighteen years ago now, and I'm like, oh, I can, I can, I can introduce. Maybe I can get back into this same technology. It's um, and let's be honest, if I'd had the power supply for the last five six years, I would have been doing it nonstop. <laughs> so how how are you making your um, materials? So we do what's called metal organic chemical vapor deposition um, which basically means that we have chemicals which contain the elements we want okay so to make gallium nitride you need gallium and mm. nitrogen and our gallium comes in a compound called trimethyl gallium which has some carbons and hydrogens and a gallium atom in it and our nitrogen comes from ammonia which is more a kind of familiar household compound in many ways and they are transported in another gas into a reaction chamber and the other gas is typically nitrogen or hydrogen so you have um, particularly for the trimethyl gallium a fairly low concentration of your reactant in a stream of say hydrogen and then they're brought into a reactant, reactant chamber where on which are what we call wafers which are basically flat plates that we're going to deposit our material onto and um, that's heated up and in our case also spinning round really quickly um, 
And when the molecules that are carrying the ingredients of our gallium nitride hit the hot surface of the wafer, they split up and we end up with gallium nitrogen atoms on the surface and they react to give gallium nitride. And everything we do, we deposit thin films, um, whereby thin, a kind of starting point film might be one micron, so one one thousandth of a millimetre thick. Um, whereas for other similar materials, so gallium nitride is what we call a semiconductor material. And if you are making, um, say silicon which is probably the most common ubiquitous semiconductor material that you get in huge balls so um, a ball is a great big crystal of the material and it might be like as tall as a human being and about as wide except as, rather than human being shaped <laughs> maybe a bit taller than a human being actually i'm not very tall might be as tall as you but not me <laughs> taller than me um and so you, you can get these huge crystals and then slice them into wafers, whereas we have to start off with a, a wafer or a plate of something else and use that as a, what we call a substrate, a, a starting point to put our gallium nitride on top of. Um, you can just about, well, about make big crystals of gallium nitride now, but it's, it's very difficult and very expensive to do and growing thin films is, is much more cost effective, basically. So you're working on the sort of micron scale, did you say? Depends what I'm doing. So the the we need a sort of starting point solid layer of gallium nitride that kind of establishes that we are in a gallium nitride crystal structure. But we then might put down layers of other materials, typically other nitride materials. So say mm. indium gallium nitride, which is an alloy of indium nitride and gallium nitride. But those layers, so the the actual light emitting bit of a light emitting diode, the bit where the light comes out from is typically layers of indium gallium nitride and those layers are around two or three nanometers thick so a nanometer is a thousandth of a micron or a millionth of a millimeter or i guess a billionth of a meter <laughs> i just say it's really really small <laughs> it's really really small <laughs> And, and the technique, uh, so it's a chemical vapour deposition technique. I, I think I missed the, the, the prefix that you put onto the CVD. What was that? Metal organic, so MO, metal organic. Ah, okay, cool. Just meaning that the, the, the gallium or other metals are in a compound with organic carbon and hydrogen groups. Yeah, so um, I'm more of a physical vapour deposition person. I've spent most of my time doing that. Um, but I did do some chemical vapor deposition uh well i've done atomic layer um deposition mm. so that was yeah i mean you you're growing that on the sort of uh, atomic layer uh, that was a very very slow process i don't know what your process is like but that took forever so we get the gallium nitride i guess we probably grow at around a micron an hour roughly something like that. that's not bad um, some of the other layers we would be growing a lot slower because we get better quality material and better control of the thickness if yeah. we grow slower. Um, and some of the materials are very, very slow to grow and actually we sometimes need a bit more thickness off them and that becomes a bit tedious. So I had a project for a while working on indium aluminium nitride, which is yet another nitride alloy. Um, and that grew very slowly and we needed a lot of layers. Um, so like growing one sample in one case took 16 hours um, and the reactor that we were working on I mean the reactor itself gets very hot it's meant to get very hot but the, the surrounding electronics that were driving the damn thing got very hot and the transformers these things run with fairly high voltages as I'm sure you realize and the transformers all started to make this horrendous buzzing noise and it, it started to get a bit dodgy <laughs> yeah that does sound good and that we, we decided that, that whilst it was a very nice experiment and we were very pleased with the sample we were not going to be able to do it very regularly because we didn't know the lab would survive as such wow yeah i think i was growing 100 nanometers uh, using atomic layer deposition i was growing 100 nanometers and that of uh aluminium doped zinc oxide and i think that took two or three hours or something like yeah. that and i have there are materials that i've grown um with sputtering that um yeah i had 12 13 14 hour depositions and if one of them failed right at the end mm. <laughs> the, the brandy came out um <laughs> yeah no some of these things can take so long but uh, mm. and then other things like i'm growing things at the minute and i'm literally deposition time is a minute and i've got a <laughs> micrometer and i'm like <laughs> 
go figure go figure um of course i think i'm starting to move on to the slower growing stuff again because of course why not but like you say you've got the control you've got the control you can sort of really sort of um control how it grows control the structure control the properties and stuff like that and that's the interesting rate when you are putting it down in a minute there's nothing you can do you just turn it on and turn it off again is there still a lot of so you, i mean you mentioned that we're using this in light emitting diodes um in fact my monitor's got a surrounding ring of uh, leds um is there still a lot of research going in i mean have we not got those light bulbs now are we not finished or no, what is it done. that you're trying yeah. to do sorry <laughs> Yeah, so, so not everything I do is LED, but there's still quite a lot to do in LED. When I started working on light emitting diodes, the big thing was getting a peak efficiencies in the blue light emitting diodes. So it's the, the blue emitters are the ones that are mostly used in your light bulbs. So you wouldn't okay. think about blue light, you'd think it was white light, but actually um, the blue light is then absorbed by a material called phosphor and the phosphor gives out a load of other colours depending on exactly what chemicals have been included in it. Mm. Blue plus all the others is what's giving you your white light. Now, um, there's a couple of reasons we do it that way. You have to, you can't easily take red light and make it into blue light. That would be what's called up conversion. So one, one fundamental particle of light is called a photon and one photon of blue light has more energy than one photon of red light. So you can't make, there's no possible way of making one photon of red light into one photon of blue light because you'd have an, a lack of energy. Okay. Um, so up conversion is really hard because it involves combining multiple red, red photons to give blue photons effectively. Down conversion is easy because you just have to basically make your blue photon in some way lose some energy. And the way you do that is you absorb it by the phosphor and it is out a photon of lesser energy and some energy is wasted. Okay. So, so that's why everything starts from blue light. It could start from ultraviolet light and we could convert all of it, but the blue light is useful in and of itself. We want some blue light in our, in our room light. So blue's great. Um, so the first reason we're starting from blue is that we can down convert, but we can't up convert. Fine. But when I'm talking about it, you can hear that I'm saying, oh, well, the blue light has to lose energy to be the red light or make the green light. So obviously that's not actually efficient and we don't use that energy for something else. It just makes a bit of heat and is not terribly helpful. And that's not what we want for energy efficiency. But the green LEDs are bad in terms of efficiency and the yellow ones are terrible. I mean, really appalling. Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then you come across to red and you can make red ones out of a different material, um, indium, gallium, aluminium, phosphide, that kind of family of materials, so phosphide materials rather than nitride materials. And then, we, then, then red, at least in terms of the sort of LEDs you might put in a light bulb, is okay. Mm. So one of the things we're worrying about is that gap in the middle, the green and yellow, where nothing is very efficient at all. Oh. Um, and if we could make green green's improving a lot these days if we could make green and yellow both um really really efficient then you'd make your white light by just having a few of each color of led and you wouldn't have these down conversion losses which would be nice um but also then you could say okay well now it's the morning and we should have this kind of sunrise color of light you take some of the blue out put a bit more yellow and red in and then you get to midday when the light is actually very blue that comes from the sun and you could adjust that and then you'd adjust it back again and you could make the diurnal cycle happen in your room lighting because you could adjust it all just wow. by changing how much current you put through each device um so we could do more just with normal lights if we could solve this problem with the efficient, efficiency of green and yellow. And then the other thing that's really, really interesting now, what's really hot in planet LED at the moment, if you like, is micro LEDs. So mm. um, particularly for augmented reality or virtual reality, so for these headsets, okay? Because what you're trying to do there is like create this whole other reality, this whole kind of convincing world in a display. So it needs to be really, really high resolution and it's really close to your eyes. So if you if the LEDs are at all big, you see the pixels and it yeah. messes up the illusion. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And for augmented reality, where you're kind of overlaying it on the normal world around you, it also has to be really bright because it has to compete with like you being outdoors in bright sunlight. 
So really bright and really small and really fast switching to make the, 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 the kind of flow, the speed of the illusion work is yeah. very, very difficult to do. And it suddenly turned out, I suppose not suddenly, but maybe we hadn't worried about it until it hit a kind of crux point that we can no longer do red either. Oh. Indium gallium aluminium phosphide materials family, they're great for big devices, but they're very intolerant of edges. And the smaller you make the device, the more edge you've got. Oh. And the presence of the edge makes the device less and less and less efficient as it gets smaller and smaller. Um, so now we're down to, oh, I mean, I know people who are working on these at devices that are only kind of two microns across. I mean, these are basically the cubes of material. Um, they just don't work anymore, basically, if you're working with them. And so now we're, hmm. if you'd asked me 10 years ago, you know, Rachel, you're going to make red LEDs and the gallium nitride material system. I'd be like, no, why the hell would you do that? We've already got red LEDs. <laughs> and so I'm working on projects trying to make very, very small red LEDs, and it's really hard. Wow. <laughs> but this shows, I mean, it shows how much things change and how that, you know, we couldn't have really imagined the same sort of virtual reality um 10 years mm. ago and that's and that's just something that's really starting to take off and really starting to grow at the moment um yeah and and, and who knows maybe well i don't know if you've seen the film ready player one but uh, you know maybe that's our future i've read the book <laughs> oh right in that case do not watch the film because um the book is <laughs> amazing and the film I like the book is mm. not as good as the book that's yeah. a useful one and I shall stick with me book. <laughs> I think if you've not read the book, the film's fine. But having read the book, eesh, um, and I've not heard good things about Red Player 2 book yet. So um, oh. anyway, uh, I've read some of his other books and they just they didn't, he just captured something with that book. Um, mm. And and what's also really interesting is that, you know, we're both material scientists and we're working on really similar things, but we're doing it in different ways. And, you know, I didn't really know much about how LEDs were working. I didn't really know much about what you were, you know, what you do. I, I knew that you mm. were making these gallium nitride systems, um, but I never really thought about how LEDs are working. And like you say, they're ev you know, they're everywhere. They're all around us. Um, and so that's really interesting. So the... So, so is it a case that you're because uh, you talked about um sort of adding in sort of other um materials over the top of them to absorb but i is it also true that if you're doping with different materials that's you're releasing different color photons is that how it's working yeah. um, exactly so basically so there's a key kind of parameter about semiconductor materials which is called the band gap okay mm -hmm. Now, band gap is one of those, it's, explaining it properly would be a long explanation. But basically, in these materials, electrons are allowed to be at certain energies and they're not allowed to be at certain other energies. Okay? And it sounds like a weird, unfamiliar thing, but it's only really like saying, like, if I got off my, sat, being sat on my bum and stood on my chair, I would be completely stable, stood on my chair, okay? and I could jump off and I'd be again completely stable once I was on the floor. And both are stable energy states for a Rachel but Rachel does not have a stable energy state kind of hovering halfway up my chair like <laughs> flapping my arms and trying to stay up um, so that is not a stable energy state for Rachel I'm not allowed to be there that's a kind of forbidden place as far as I'm concerned and it's just the same electrons can't be in this forbidden gap so when an LED works there's one band which we call the conduction band and another band we call the valence band and a gap in between and an electron falls from the conduction band into the valence band and it loses energy just as I would lose energy by jumping off my chair okay um and it has to get rid of that energy somehow and when I jump off my chair I like make a thud and the ground vibrates and stuff but the electron loses its energy by giving out a photon and the size of the, the sorry the color of the photon is the same as the energy of the photon and equates to the size of that gap how far the electron has fallen from one band to another and different materials have different sizes of the gap. So I talk about making indium gallium nitride. And if that indium gallium nitride is, doesn't have any gallium in, so if it's just indium nitride, then the band gap is quite narrow. And the light that's given out is actually in the infrared. Okay. 
um, so the, 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 the red wavelengths beyond visible red that we can't see. Um, and if it's gallium nitride, the band gap is quite wide. Um, and the light that's given out is in the ultraviolet. And by changing the amount of indium, we can get any colour in between those two extremes. So you can do, the thing that's amazing about indium gallium nitride and the nitride family more broadly, is you can do any colour of visible light. If you add in aluminium gallium nitride or aluminium indium nitride, you can get out into the deep ultraviolet. So kind of very, very, very highly energetic ultraviolet light, dangerous stuff that, well, in fact, the sort of light that doesn't, is so ultraviolet it doesn't get through the atmosphere, not just the sort that gives you sunburn, beyond the sunburn point. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I guess it gives you ultra sunburn of some sort. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, you can do any colour you like, really. And um, within, I mean, there are some bounds, but it's a, a huge spectrum of, 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 of different colours of light you can get, which all sounds great, except that um, basically, I wouldn't say the blue LED was easy. The people who invented the original blue LEDs got the Nobel Prize for it for a good reason. It was a hard mm. thing to do, um, but there are things about how the material needs to grow which makes going from blue to the green to the amber to the red really really difficult that is by far the best explanation that rachel on a chair is the best <laughs> explanation of band gap uh, and energy states that i've heard that's awesome so that i'm going to be taking that when forward. i do it in person and, and and when i'm not actually sat on a chair that rotates i actually just jump off and on and off chairs <laughs> even better even better awesome. i did it in i did it at the science festival in cambridge a couple of years ago but the, the last science festival didn't happen because of the lockdowns so it would have been the one before that yeah um, and I got in trouble with the safety officer for not having risk assessed jumping off the chair. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, well, there we go. Uh, <laughs> that's live. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, yeah, that sounds about right. And to be fair, it, it's interesting because it's like if I was the person giving the demo, I'm like, oh, but then if I was the safety officer, I'd be the one telling people as well. <laughs> like, I understand both sides of it. So, yeah, uh, <laughs> go figure. <laughs> uh, yeah so so that's really cool and like you say the the different materials so are you trying to are you basically concentrating on those sort of materials because you know i mean different um materials different atoms different uh yeah materials are, are giving out different colors but are there only certain ones that are practical from an led point of view i'm guessing that if they're insulators or if they're they're no good. Yeah, so I mean anything we're talking about here has to be semiconducting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now um oh, yeah. metals basically okay. I'm always careful here because it's actually wrong to say that metals don't have a band gap, but metals don't don't have a useful band gap, let's say, is a better way of putting it. Um and all materials that you would think of as insulators, the band gap is so wide that you mm -hmm. can't any um electrons across and into the higher band in order to have them available to fall down so in fact aluminium nitride in its kind of normal state is absolutely an insulator it's a ceramic you can... but we and we we play some games to get get it just about conducting some electricity um so everything conducts electricity the thing that becomes in a semiconducting fashion um the thing that becomes hard is how you make the material so all of these things are grown what's called epitaxially, okay? Um, and that basically means that we're starting off with a beautiful, perfect crystal of gallium nitride in which all the atoms are lined up in lovely rows and lovely planes in a very organized fashion, um, like squares on a chessboard or bricks on a Lego wall, something like that, okay? And, um, and if you imagine, yeah, Lego bricks is a good analogy. If you imagine bricks the the little nobles that make the lego bricks to get fit together have a very exact spacing between them okay and if you imagine somebody who like wasn't lego some kind of fake lego company made something that was trying to be lego but had a slightly different spacing between the bricks between the nobles on the top mm. if it was only a tiny 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 bit different you could kind of force them together if you shoved hard but if you had a very different spacing you just wouldn't be able to keep building your wall when you got to one of these new bricks and the indium atoms in indium gallium nitride are like kind of two large lego bricks trying to fit into the gallium nitride wall um 
So that means that you kind of shove them in when you can shove a few of them in and you can just about make them fit. Um, but if you want to shove a lot of them in because you want to get towards the green or the amber and the red needs the narrower banga, which needs a lot more indium, um, then the, the way the crystal grows starts to get disrupted by what we call the strain, the lack of space for those two large indium Lego bricks. Mm. Um, so then we have to play a lot of tricks to kind of try and force the indium to stay where you want it in the crystal and to not have the crystal be full of mistakes. Because once the crystal's got mistakes in, um, this nice process where the, the electron drops from the top band to the bottom band and the light comes out, it can happen other ways. It basically gives like alternative pathways for that energy loss to happen. And those alternative pathways, sometimes they give out the wrong color of light, but quite often they just give out heat. Mm -hmm. um, and then the device is it's inefficient because it's losing en energy to heat, which is the, the one thing you're trying not to do in making an efficient light bulb. You want all your energy to go to light. And also it makes the device get hot and that makes it still less efficient, which makes the device get hotter. And at some point it just get, like, blows up, basically, which is bad. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> generally. <laughs> Sometimes they literally go sort of explode. Sometimes they just kind of get hot and then die in a slightly, slightly disappointing fashion. But none of these things are good. Um, so, um, yeah, so the, the fact that the indium doesn't fit into, into the gallium nitride crystal very well, the more you put in, the more of a problem it becomes. So that, yeah, the red emitters, which need a lot of indium, are really problematic. Well, again, another really good explanation of how things go together. Um, so I'm going to start trying to force stickle bricks into Lego spaces. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and you're talking about some of these materials. I guess you're using sort of Indian as a dopant. All the materials that you're using, are they fairly abundant? Are they ones that we've got enough, at, uh, enough of? I know um, I was looking at aluminium dilt dub zinc oxide because mm. indium tin oxide we were using a lot of it and there was sort of limited indium and it was going up um and obviously lights are even more prevalent than <laughs> probably anything else so how how are the how's the sustainability of the materials so i mean both indium and gallium are to a certain extent a concern but i mm. think the thing people need to realize particularly with the indium in the blue LED is just how tiny the volume of material we are using is. Yeah. Um, so an LED is not a large device. I mean, a, a typical LED light bulb might have several LEDs in, but those LEDs may only be a third of a millimeter across, 300 microns, something like that. Um, and then the thickness of the indium gallium nitrate containing layers, there may be a few of them, but they'll only be two nanometers thick. And those in those two nanometers, the material for blue LED is probably only about maybe 15% indium, maybe 20, something like that. Mm -hmm. You don't get through a lot of indium if we're honest. Um, we get through rather more gallium, but gallium's somewhat more earth abundant yeah. than indium. If we do do to go to huge amounts of these VR displays, like, I don't know, it may get a bit more pressed because the, the red devices, if we get there, are gonna need more, more thickness of indium gallium nitride to make them work. Um, but yeah, I think because um, the ITO problem is that ITO is used for all sorts of things because it's a trans transparent conductor and it's very, very useful in a huge number of situations. Yeah. And it's actually using more volume than, we, than the indium we use in indium gallium nitride. Also, they've learned to recycle things a little bit that have ITO, in, so that helps as well. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, no, it, it just sort of struck me, and it was just sort of I was just wondering in my background, and uh, you know, it's nice to be a little bit eco aware. Uh, <laughs> Always. Well, if you're trying to to make energy emitting light bulb, uh, uh, sorry, trying to make low energy light bulbs, energy efficient light bulbs, it would be a shame to say, oh, actually, they're 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 really energy efficient, but we're completely de depleting the world supply of this vital resource. That doesn't really help, does it? <laughs> well, exactly, and so it's sort of that's sort of why uh, it made me think but um that's a good they answer also they, they also should last a really long time yeah we reckon lifetime for an indium gallium nitride led is in excess of fifty thousand hours which is an awful lot of days yeah. lights on for a couple of hours if you know what i mean yeah um the funny thing about that is so when I was fairly early in my career looking at these things, one of the people I was working with had a project which was all about failure modes in mm. 
LED lighting and, and LEDs in general. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting things that might happen when LEDs fail at the down at the very small scale involving tiny mistakes in the crystal and how that, and, and we had this whole picture of the interesting science we were going to do. And well, I'm hoping it's better now, but at the time we discovered, I think two main failure modes for LEDs. One of which was that they need um, metallic leads to connect to the light emitting diode to get the electricity in and out, and then used to fall off. And if you stuck them back on, the LED worked again. <laughs> so you just melt in the one. connector. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the second one, um, which was even more exciting, <laughs> not really, was that um, when people had made LEDs before, they'd made red LEDs and they'd use a specific polymer to cap this. Mm these red LEDs and it would work fine as a, like a protective cap basically and then they basically when they'd come to make blue LEDs they'd stuck the same polymer on the top. Um, now blue LEDs particularly at the time used to have a little bit of ultraviolet light, near ultraviolet light coming mm. through um, and probably we're better at not having that now because we're trying to be quite careful around about not introducing extra UV into the environment but the mm. person we're looking at at the time did leak ultraviolet a little bit. Um, and the polymer in question used to go brown when exposed to ultraviolet light. So the, the LED itself dimmer and dimmer, and we were like, oh, yeah, interesting failure mechanism here. And it would turn out that when you took the polymer cap off, it had gone kind of dark brown by this point, and that the LED underneath was fine. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's one of those sort of things that it's like, it, it's so obvious and it's so simple and such a simple mechanism when you say it, but if you've not thought about it and you don't realize what it is, it's just like, you can be scratching your head. I yeah. mean, it, yeah. Huh. But the person whose postdoctoral project it was, who'd come in with this great excitement about all these interesting atom atomistic mechanisms by which LEDs might be failing and spent two years taking them apart and going, yeah, the cat on this one's gone brown and the leaves fallen off that one. It was quite disappointing. Oh, wow. Me but i mean we can we can sort of make lots and lots of really sort of interesting uh discoveries during a phd thesis during a project or we can make some you know a couple of discoveries like that but then impact wise that's a it huge matters. impact it matters yeah yes yeah, i mean that's massive <laughs> like, we fed it, back. So it, it was an industry link project and we fed it back to the industrial partner and they were very interested yeah exactly um and I think that's where you sort of have a little bit of a, a difference between industry and, and sort of academic research, because I think we're trying to find lots of things and interesting things and more of them and lots of intricate things and industry just like, oh, this falls off. Right. That's good to know. <laughs> we'll change the solder. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I would say the, the, big, the big discoveries are the, the smallest, relatively simple ones, but you still got to discover them. Well, that's so cool. Thanks for sort of uh, talking about uh, what you do more. Like, like I say, it's sort of just give me a bit more information and uh, made me realise it's really cool. Um, I hadn't thought about a lot of this before. I hadn't thought just how much was going into our LEDs. So uh, it's good to know. Um, but um, I also want to talk about your research that you do sort of, uh, well, about the work that you do outside the lab as well. So you're a big advocate for um sort of diversity in stem equity in stem um i think something along the lines of 70 percent of the people that have been on this podcast have been tigers uh um the inclusion group for equity and research in stem uh awful lot of tigers on here an awful lot of people that i know and uh, you're the tiger in charge you're the uh, <laughs> you're the tiger that started it all yeah so tell me about that I don't think I really intended to start an online diversity campaigning group. It just kind of happened. <laughs> um, so the origins of all this are in a process called My Science Inquiry. Um, so I suppose the origins are even before that, really. So I was, I follow various parliamentary select committees and things on Twitter because I went to a training provided by the university, which told me that that was the best place to find out about what inquiries were going on that were relevant. Oh. And if you wanted to in, like 
use your science to influence policy making that was where you need to start i was like well i can do that i can follow ah. twitter um yeah. And I saw a thing one day that was asking about the balance of UK research and innovation funding. And I saw balance and I thought balance between different diverse people, you know, is, are we well balanced in terms of do we have enough women working in the physical sciences? Are we well balanced in, in that we're making sure people from ethnic minority backgrounds are included in our, our scientific process, that kind of thing. Now that wasn't what they meant by balance. What they meant by balance was like, um, blue skies versus industry driven um and i think they were also interested in regional like dispersion of funds and those sorts mm. of things um but you know somebody was i was on twitter it's very easy to ask questions on twitter um yeah. so having realized i was asked, I, I got the wrong end of the stick i i tweeted whoever had put out the original tweet back to them saying are you interested in balance from the point of view of um, gender and other aspects of diversity or something like that i can't remember exactly what i said and expected to get totally ignored and within an hour was on the phone to the clerk of the committee saying that would be very interesting can you get us a submission in um and i was like uh yeah probably when we need it and he's like well tomorrow would be good but we can give an extension of about four days i think <laughs> and so suddenly having put my fat foot in it i was leading a submission on gender diversity and other aspects of um equality and diversity to to, to a um parliamentary select committee um and they didn't actually ever use any of that information but in order to get it together i basically panicked and sent a lot of direct messages to people can you help me with this and suddenly we had a group that was worrying about these things together in a kind of online space um and then when they said when they decided that actually no they weren't interested in that kind of balance at all that diversity was not their thing at the moment um they rang me up again and said well you know we're not using this information now but the committee thought that's something maybe they ought to be thought of thinking about and could they encourage me to put in a submission for my science inquiry mm -hmm. where they have a um like a call to the general public which turns out almost entirely to be a call to a load of scientists to say what topics should the science and technology committee be worrying about um and you had to do a 200 word pitch that you should um this is this is the thing they should look at so having been writing for their original evidence call about um diversity and the funding profile and funding policy i was like right okay well let's tell them that they should have an inquiry about diversity and funding policy and we thought in the group i think you were involved in these discussions about broadening it to being like all of diversity in mm -hmm. some ways. um but decided not to because partly there's a lot of kind of very broad conversations about diversity in science that do a lot of hand wringing and oh dear there aren't enough women oh dear we're not seeing enough black people coming through and all they do is the hand wringing because they've mm. tried to encompass this whole enormous problem and you can't you can't solve everything all at once with one click of the fingers so i wanted to focus it down on something that actually i thought parliament could have some influence in because they they hold the purse strings and they provide money to most of the funders and they quite often actually put out like big diktats as to how that money is allowed to be spent or how we're allowed to decide who gets the money or whatever else so if that aspect of the whole system could be more thoughtful in terms of how it influences the diversity of the scientific community then that will trickle down to a lot of the other aspects um so that was all great and we put in the the my science inquiry pitch and they picked us to be one of their inquiries for that year and and everything was going great guns and i was um very happy and very proud of the group of people who'd done it and we kind of formalized the the, the informal group that had just kind of come together to write the documents and stuff as tigers the inclusion group for equity and research in stem and we were basically working hard together and we still are drawing together evidence of where the problems lie and the funding amongst other things and also starting to do a load of other stuff together um but then um brexit kind of happened at us so the whole process of the select committees and other things was very much disturbed by um the prorogation of parliament because mm. they stopped doing everything and then by what was essentially a second in a very short period of time snap general election yeah um so 
once they'd had a general election, they then didn't, the new select committee with an entirely different chair and a broadly different group of people didn't have to take up the inquiries that the old select committee had been. Um, and so we wrote to the new chair of the committee to try and persuade him that he should. And, um, and then COVID happened. <laughs> Yeah. So then the, the, the Select Committee on Science and Technology, in fact, you know, have been working really hard to scrutinise the COVID response, but the stuff we were interested in kind of got lost mm -hmm. in that. And there have been, so I've been in correspondence with them and there have been some sessions about, which were meant to have some probing of diversity aspects in the discussions with funders by the Select Committee, but really it's just kind of got brushed aside into other things. It got about 10, 15 minutes at the end of one session. Um, and um, that's about it really. Um, yeah. But the, the group of people who came together are still really passionate about making science more diverse and there's lots of different ways we can do that and i think the the process of kind of creating a potential inquiry and the preparatory work that was done by the select committee for that inquiry and the pressure that was put on some of the funders as a result has has demonstrated to the funding bodies that there is real passion for change in the in the community and that there are lots of ideas out there for how things might change and also i think that there's an extent to which people are not just going to put up with the status quo anymore so i think you know we have created some beginnings of change but not not quite as we hoped to <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's maybe not sort of been the complete direction that was the initial intent but i mean you can't underestimate i think whenever i'm talking to funders whenever i'm talking to societies they know who the takers are they they are fully aware of the work that the tigers are doing and take it quite seriously actually i mean it's it's never talked about in a oh, tigers it's it's always it's always quite a positive you know response and I mean, there have been inquiries that have come together and reports that have come together from funding bodies that, I mean, I'm sure they would have come out eventually, but I think that they were definitely kind of pushed by tigers. Um, you know, the, in the EPSRC gender report recently, I mean, feels like this is one of the, you know, many things that whether it was directly or indirectly, it certainly seems to have come about a few years after Tiger started. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, so there is an inside story on that that I'm probably not allowed to tell. Yes. <laughs> um, um, so um, certainly there has been um, some dialogue on that question. Yep, yeah, yeah, I could, I, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's true. And so, like I say, whilst it might not have necessarily been uh, from the Science Committee, Mm. But it, it's i find it positive that there are these consultations happening about how to do funding how to make it more equitable how to make it better for different people um and we've, i've seen a slew of sort of initiatives or like say consultations going out over the recent history and like i said i mean we were sort of moving towards that but i think that tigers has really formed a good focus and it's been able to sort of drive the dialogue and and focus the dialogue and another thing with tigers is i mean there's been so many documents that have come out that are collaborative documents there's been so yeah. many articles written um and so one of the things we hmm. the very beginning was started collecting resources so that on the tiger in stem web page there is a ton of links to like all sorts of articles about what the challenges are faced by women, by LGBTQ people, by people of different ethnicities, by disabled people, and hopefully more and more also about some of the intersections between those different characteristics. Um, and that, well, A, all that resource is there and was always intended to be for anybody who went looking mm -hmm. to be useful, but it also means that we're all more aware and more like educated than we were. And then we've started to pull together a lot of our own 
articles about things. Also, we write more campaigny directly campaigny type articles. Um, so there have been a couple of letters we wrote to the Sunday Times, one of which was about um, a gentleman called Professor Strumia, often known in my world as he who must not be named, sort of mm-hmm, mm-hmm. rule there, um, who thinks women aren't any good at physics, which is sad. Um, his loss. Um, yeah. And um, another one about some of the issues that have been going on about um, transgender people in academia, where uh, there has been an awful lot of negative stuff coming out um, from academics that have also really been affecting the the environment within which trans students and trans um, co-workers mm. study and work and exist. And it was important to us as a group, as you all remember, that we said, you know, we are in solidarity with our trans colleagues and we believe in their importance and their right to be within our academic workplaces safe and happy and effective and well just getting on with stuff really i don't need to tell you any of this stuff <laughs> no but and, and and that's where it's really important um it's a it's a it's a large sign from the scientific community we're in a really weird time at the moment where <clears throat> I think trust and faith in academics and in uh, science is sort of seems to be a, in a low at the moment. Seems to be in a bit of a lull. Mm. Um, but then at the same time, you've got people trying to use science to keep people down. Trans people, in particular, is one um, yeah. thing. Like you say, people trying to use science to say that women can't do science or that um, black people aren't as good at doing academia as others. I mean, people are really trying to whilst we've got the lack of trust in science we've also got this pseudoscience that people are using and seem to be listening to yeah um there's a new sort of campaign group who of scientists around the uk none of them who uh do anything to do with the medical uh study or research of, of trans people who have come together as scientists and said you know the truth in science about trans and how it is a fad and blah 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 um and people do listen to that. So I think when you've got a group like Tigers who have a good reputation and come together and have people from different backgrounds and it's, for, it's of a unified message, it's a unified message. And that's, it's really important. Um, and people do see that and people do take note of that. And it means a lot. I wasn't, you know, with the Tigers, we weren't... <sighs> the trans issue um in particular that an article that was in the times i wasn't really expecting a response from tigers at the time like it didn't seem you know and i'm speaking as a trans person it didn't necessarily seem relevant and yet all of a sudden it's like we're writing an article and we're going to do this and we're going to sign it and i'm like wow this is (laughs) this is awesome that was an interesting thing because i remember the person who was leading it said you know you know, we can't go forward unless Rachel, who's, you know, officially in charge kind of thing, says yes. And I was like, well, okay, I understand why you're saying that, but it's not as if I'm going to say no. <laughs> you know, um, you know yeah. that this is not, that, that, that not supporting that would be kind of separate to something other than who we are. And we wrote, you know, we have a code of conduct. We have, mm-hmm. have a, a kind of set of administrative documents which say who we are and they are very carefully written to be very specific on this particular issue i mean actually they're very specific on a number of issues but this was one that we were very aware of particularly because of some of the the very negative and unpleasant things that have been said within the academic community um we wanted to make sure that everybody who joined us as part of a group understood that we are i think trans affirming is a reasonable way of yeah um it's hmm. i always find to have difficulty with the language because you know i almost feel i don't have a right to say we affirm you as a trans person you, you just are you are yourself yeah. you are. You know? <laughs> um that's not that's not my job to be able to say you are or aren't of course you are Clara. yeah it's it's more that unequivocal uh, unequivocal support and mm. acceptance and it's just like you are and and yeah. that's it. It's just acceptance. It's like you end of well, yeah. We don't yeah. have to, we. This is not this is not something we are going go, go, going going in tigers to have a debate about. Um, we are beyond that debate, and we're hoping other people might catch up eventually. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, this is another thing, and I've touched on this with other um of these chats with other tigers. 
I've said it's a really good space because we're all able to understand that we're not 100%. We understand where our expertise ends and we understand that we, you know, we know when to defer to other people and sort of to raise other people up and ask them questions. And it's interesting that in a lot of the discussion that you see in the media and in academic circles says that, uh, and again, the trans think you know talking about trans rights is a good example but people say there's no debate there's no discussion we can't have um you know civil conversation how we're supposed to learn and they sort of use it as we're trying to shut down um discussion and debate and actually with tigers i know that if i don't know something about race i can go and Mm. i can ask someone and i can get those questions and we can have that conversation and we just know that we've got a respectful framework for having that conversation and you're going to that person to ask them because they know more about it than you do. Yeah. And it shows that you can have respectful discussion of other people's diversities, that you can ask questions, that you can learn and do so in a, a respectful and, like I say, meaningful way. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I find difficult these days because now I've been doing this for a couple of years and people seem to think I know what I'm doing (laughs) but I always and I will continue to say this possibly till I'm you know 92 that I always feel I'm you know a beginner in this space it's not you know my expertise is in light emitting materials my expertise Mm. in diversity but I think um coming at these questions kind of admitting that you're beginning and you're learning and that you're you're open to, to learning i think makes a real difference um and i think it's it means that i i, I get i get very nervous when people expect me to have expertise that i haven't got um and um and sometimes i get asked to do things that i'm quite scared about mm. um and then sometimes i realize that although maybe i am a beginner in the space it's partly because nobody's got any answers and perhaps me you know talking from what little experience i have is the least worst thing available right now but that's it i think that a a large part of knowing how to move forward is having people that um are able to listen and know like i don't know this but here's a person sort of Mm. um being able to sort of direct people because there's so many people out there that are willing to say oh yes i know about this um and then do a quick google and we'll sort of tell people this is how i as a white person this is how we fix racism but you know you're not doing that you're like hey we've got these people we've got these people um uh, racism is bad that's obvious and now if you want to learn more here are <laughs> yeah. the people to speak to um same with sort of ableism and things like that and that's and again i think this just sort of shows that we can have this constructive uh these constructive discussions that we can work together to improve things that i i know that within the tigers you know if i say something wrong i'm willing to have someone tell me but they'll do it in a respectful way and we'll understand and if i need questions i can ask about it and it means that you're not worried about getting things wrong, which means that you're more willing to try things. And yeah, um, yeah. and I think that's that's it. It's this mutual respect. It's a respect thing. Uh, we're not invalidating anyone, mm. um, and we do respect people for who they are. And um, but with and so any questions or mistakes that happen come from a place of wanting to improve or you know just getting things wrong whereas i think when you're hearing people talk about shutting down academic discussion or whatever they're coming from a point of view of they know full well what they're saying is wrong on some level or that people think it's wrong and they're just there to to stir yeah but i think the the difficulty is well yeah so the thing that i think is true with how we have discussions within tigers is that we accept people for who they are and as what they are as a starting point in the discussion Mm. and then maybe we have a discussion about how things might work within that acceptance yeah we don't have discussions which start by questioning anybody's right to exist as the person 
happen to be. Um, and there's a difference there. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, like, and maybe this is part of why, like say societies and, and funding bodies and stuff will listen to the tigers because we're trying to go about it in the right way, we're trying to go about it in a transparent way. And, like you say open and we we're showing that you can have discussions that you can have debates that you can learn um and i i think that's yeah i think it's I valuable think, <laughs> i think also so a thing that's always been a bit of a tension is between like trying to be a group that we have a very clear picture of what our principles are and what we think is the right thing that should happen mm. but we can take those forward working with people like the funders or we can stand in strict opposition to them and we've in general chosen the route of trying to be cooperative and constructive and sort of the word that that the people at EPSRC that one of the funders that I work with uses sort of co-creating these changes mm. um, and I think there's there's actually space for both approaches and sometimes I wonder if we ought to be more pushy and more protesty and more radical than we actually are and that mm. maybe the system is so broken it just needs tearing down and stamping on <laughs> and we can start again with something new. Um, but for now, where we're at is that we, we're tr trying to be helpful. Mm. Um, sometimes the term that gets used about some of the ways we do things is we try to be a critical friend. Mm. Um, and um, we don't always hit the right tone on that. Sometimes we miss, but that's that's how we're working, I guess. Yeah. But we're willing to listen, and you know, we've not been without criticism within between members and stuff like that. And yeah, we don't absolutely. always have the same way. I mean, of going about things. I mean, just within the Tigers, you know, the Institute of Physics is one. I'm not going to sort of linger on talking about them, but you've got some people who have very much sort of been public criticism and and walking away and then i know that i've sort of made a little bit of criticism but also i've been working a lot closer with them recently because these things aren't these systems aren't going to get torn down at the end of the day they're not going to be torn down and restarted and so if they're going to be um you know if they're going to change how they do things then they need those critical friends they need those yeah. people to work with them um and I think that if you're willing, I, I say, I, I talk about this a lot in terms of working with university and equality and diversity groups, but I feel like I'm being nice. I'm, you know, I'm patting people on the back for the bare minimum and quite a lot of, of stuff, but it means that those groups will listen. And also you can, you can implement change. You can influence the way they listen to things. And it means that I've been in a few meetings where I've said some quite radical things, but people are listening because, gen because I framed it in a less radical way. And also because generally they sort of see me as the reasonable voice. And I don't know. I, I, and I back, back and forth. I mean, there's certain things where we just need to tear it down. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess I get I get frustrated at times by the pace of change or the lack mm. of pace of change. Um, but um, yeah. I mean, at a personal level, I think I am more effective working with people than than trying to tear things down. Um, yeah different personalities are, are good at doing different things different ways and yeah i think i'm probably a a better collaborator cooperator co-conspirator whatever um, than i am the person with the hammer although sometimes so the the pandemic period has been deeply frustrating not only because some of the um sort of trajectories of things that tigers were doing have have, have been knocked aside mm. but so because um, there's been, we've been in such a panic, rightly in such a panic and with so much attention focused on the virus that um, some things have just been 
miss that should have been paid attention to and in places and maybe this is more broadly than in science but in the broader kind of human rights space some things have just been kind of written out like we can't really be bothered to deal with this at the moment because of covid you know there have been a lot of blacks on things like disabled people's rights um and um yeah i mean i know everyone's been under extraordinary pressure and it's been the people who have to make these decisions are doing so under very very difficult circumstances but yeah there were there were times this summer when it just felt like the only thing you could do was like fight fires like there was a pro a new problem with something coming up every five minutes that somebody needed to say something about and you, you couldn't hold enough fire hoses to deal with them all that's exactly how it was uh, i was thinking it was like there was just so many fires recently mm. um i mean some of them have not been pandemic related but i think the the no. additional pressures of the ones added by the but by some of the issues which arose because of the pandemic have just made it feel like yeah yeah like there's a cartoon on, on the internet with a dog sat at a table with all these flames around him fine and it felt like that apart from it really wasn't fine yeah yeah and it, oh oh i don't know whether this is going to be a whole can of worms for the end of the conversation <laughs> no i i'm just uh, i mean coming back to you know what you were talking about with the sort of aims of bringing uh, uh, starting tigers and the my science inquiry obviously it was about trying to embed um equity into the funding into the funding bodies and i mean one of the best things that we've seen over the last few years was the fact that um certain funding bodies said that you had to have athena swan silver in in order to move forward so athena swan is uh, gender equality it, it's mostly looking at the binary genders but that's not quite true they're changing the wording um and there was a bunch of funding bodies said that you've got yeah well there was a funding body said you had to have silver in order to be awarded anything and this was i thought this was great because it meant that you know people departments had to start embodying uh, uh, embedding equity of course, the recent group of sort of science committee have sort of changed that and, and said that they're not allowed to tell people to have Athena Swan Silver anymore. I mean, what do you make of that? So, yeah, so this was a government diktat and the Science and Technology Committee did actually ask the head of the UK Research and Innovation, so the head of basically UK research funding about it when they, this was one of the few things that got fitted into their diversity session. Mm. Um, so her reaction was that making things like Athena Swan compulsory just mean people do them in a tick box and derisory manner, don't think about them with any depth and it doesn't have any impact. Mm -hmm. Now I was very disappointed in that as an answer, if I'm honest. Firstly because there is quite good evidence that it's NIHR, the National Institutes of Health Research, who were using Athena mm -hmm. Swan um, as a kind of compulsory thing. And there is fairly good evidence that it has actually made a difference to women in leadership, getting mm. the leadership roles. So I think it's not really fair to say, oh, well, making this compulsory doesn't work when there's evidence that it was working. Um, I think the second thing I really objected to about that answer was a statement like, this hasn't been being done as well as it should, so let's not do it, let's do nothing, is not a way forward this hasn't been done as well as it should so it needs to be changed to make it work better in these ways would be much more to my taste mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um i'm not i'm not the world's biggest of famous one fan I, I i absolutely understand the concerns that it has become a bit of a tip box exercise i'm also so i'm aware that other people other nations who are looking at the kind of charter mark approach to equality and diversity so you know universities have to achieve certain standards and get a, 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 an award of some sort for their equality and diversity initiatives um, are very much not going down the Athena Swan route i.e they're not siloing mm. gender they're thinking about diversity more broadly and I think Athena Swan has been problematic in the extent to which it doesn't address non-binary genders but it also doesn't address the intersections of race disability etc with gender so i'm not saying oh yes in fact we have this perfect process that we should be using and then it should be mandated i think it does need reform but 
saying, oh, well, it's not not perfect, so let's not do it. I'm I'm quite disappointed in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I um, so I've often said that, you know, the Stonewall and the Athena Swan and, and now the sort of the race equality charter, to a huge degree, they are sort of tick boxy. They are. Um, and I, I understand that, but at the same time, I wouldn't, you know, if I was getting a new job and I saw that they didn't have them, would I be applying to them? I'd certainly be looking into why they don't. Um, and so whilst I know that they are sort of tick boxy, and I know that pe- certain groups do much better out of them just because they're able to answer the questions, even if they don't actually embed it. Um, mm. But I'd still, I still want to see something. It's the best we've got at the moment. And, you know, yeah. Like say, um, just because it's not being done right, that's how you improve it. That's how things improve. Let's improve, not remove. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, so. There's an, there's a, there's a lot of governmental attitude about equity at the moment. Um, and so there was a speech by Liz Truss last week. Um, which seemed to imply that in nineteen in the nineteen eighties in the northeast, her school had taught her about racism rather than about reading and writing. Mm. And I grew up in the northwest in the nineteen eighties, and nobody taught me a thing about racism. So maybe the northeast is different. Um, it's um, but yeah, I think um, that they've they're creating a sort of straw man from equality and diversity, a pretense of what's happening, which is completely fictional. And then they're going to proceed to burn it down um, for politically motivated reasons. Um, But we keep on keeping on nonetheless. Yeah. But uh, I mean, so we keep on raising awareness and yeah, we've just got to see how quickly we, there's a few things at the moment which are sort of concerning trends but I, I like to think that they're because people know that the world is changing the attitudes are changing and it's just a case of um making sure there's not too much damage by the time you get um uh, you, you talked about the science inquiry removing the uh, the need for a thing because it's tick box but when like you say there's evidence I mean, when our science inquiry doesn't take into account evidence, that's that's a concern to me. But there will be one. Yeah. It will change. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, we are seeing changes. You know. I mean, so, what, a year or so ago, but now a bit more than a year ago when it was Pronouns Day, I wrote a message to everyone in my department explaining why I have my pronouns, mm-hmm. email signature and, and this sort of thing. Um, and... I think if I'd done that five years ago, that I would, I, I'd have been laughed at actually, which is appalling to say, but people would have thought I was, you know, had, had something wrong with me making this suggestion. But I, and I did it last year and I got nothing but positives. That's amazing. Uh, and I also, there were one or two people who came and had a quiet word and said, thank you very much, that I'd made them feel rather more comfortable about being in the department, which was, which was the point. Um, so yeah, it, and people who I didn't think would ever take it on board have taken it on board. Yeah. And yeah. The world is changing. It yeah. is. It's all moving forward. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. You're talking about that. I know I was in a meeting recently and I said like, okay, yeah, looking at this is going to be fine. But if we really want to tackle institutional racism, we need to, you know, we need radical action. We need to really change things. We need to be brave and willing to do stuff. And like I say, it's just got to be a radical approach. And in other meetings, when I've said things like that, you just get, you know, people dismiss you. (laughs) Um, And for the first time this year, people were like, "Mm, yeah, okay, yeah. And actually listening and it's like, oh, wow, I've been able to use the word radical and (laughs) radical action and people were nodding. Yeah. So that's that's a good sign of things um, things to come. So yeah. Um, so I'm going to let you go because I've taken a lot of your time, and you're in the office, so you're busy. Um, <laughs> I'm always busy. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, is there anything that we've not talked about? Whether it's your research, whether it's the E and D, I think uh, we've talked about quite a bit. But 
we've talked about a lot i think yeah. you know, there's always more things to talk about but <laughs> well it just means that in a year's time we have to do round two so yeah okay come back in a year and ask me about quantum light sources which we've not talked about but which are fun oh interesting Ooh. <laughs> quantum light sources huh how is it about quantum i'm i'm looking at uh, quantum resonators at the minute okay interesting <laughs> <laughs> yeah huh. anyway <laughs> separate quantum se- second quantum station apparently i was going to say uh well, well good, thanks <laughs> so much for joining me and uh it's a pleasure as always to chat to you thank you for your time and lovely to speak to you lovely yeah no thanks very much bye 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 So there we have it. That was uh, Rachel. Rachel, like I say, is a huge inspiration to me. Um, uh, I mean, we're in, you know, we're in very similar fields as well. So there's that sort of science uh, and sort of overlap, but um, also just the work that she's been doing the last few years in particular. Um, you know, I've mostly known about the last few work years. She's been doing it longer than that, but just it's just really inspirational it's really great to see someone who really wants to improve equity for all not just for one group or anything and who is working hard and you know she does she she puts a lot of time and effort into this as most of my guests do so uh, that's great i will release this as a podcast as well i guess i should have said that at the beginning but hey and you can certainly find the links to my previous season uh, of these chats they're all on the podcast and they're all um, on YouTube in a playlist and if you can like and subscribe that always helps and share and things like that but until next time uh, take care and uh, bye bye <laughs>